Man, happy Easter to you. And welcome to Renovation Church. If I haven't met you yet, my name's Cody Woodard. I'm so honored that you would spend your Easter Sunday with us. Um, I don't wanna just welcome the uh, guest in the room. Can we also welcome those watching online today? Come on, y'all make some noise. Thank you for joining us online. And I also wanna welcome everybody watching in Overflow. We got people sitting all around the edges. Come on, church, can we welcome those in Overflow today? Thank you for, thank you for being here. I wanna jump straight into the text. I'm gonna be in Luke chapter 24 today. And I like to start with reading God's Word because before you need to hear my voice and what I got to say, how many of you know you need to hear the voice of God and what He's already spoken, amen? So Luke chapter 24, if you got a Bible, you can turn there. If you don't, it'll be on the screen behind me. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 13. If you're ready for the Word of God, somebody shout, I'm ready. If you need a second, say, hold up. I heard a couple hold ups, we got you. Luke chapter 24, verse 13, it'll be on the screen behind me. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they walked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas, asked, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was, prof he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was gonna redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women has said. Should have listened to the women, amen, ladies. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to him what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Jesus ghosted them. And uh, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I want you to help me out. Why don't you pick your favorite neighbor? Come on, find a favorite neighbor and look at him and just say, neighbor, you look like you lost some weight. <laughs> Happy Easter to you. <laughs> now I want you to find the neighbor you don't like that much. Give them your second option. Look at your second option and say, neighbor, you look good too, but I know you might be dealing with some stuff. You may feel hopeless, but I got good news. It's not over. Come on, help them announce my sermon title. Say, it's not over. Come on, high five three people and say, it's not over, it's not over, it's not over. It's not over. Hey, if you would and you're able, would you just stretch a hand towards heaven and let's ask God to do what only He can do today. Heavenly Father, we come to worship You. We didn't come to just go through the motions. We didn't come to just play church. We didn't come to sing corporate karaoke. We didn't just come for an egg drop. Heavenly Father, we came to encounter You. And so God, I just ask that you would meet every single person right here, right now, whatever they're dealing with, whatever they're struggling with. And God, I pray today that you would give me the ability to preach with boldness and stand on the authority of scripture. And God, I, I prophesy today to those who are hopeless that they're gonna walk in with hope. To those who feel like it's over, God, I pray that they would remember that we serve a God of resurrection and it ain't over until it's over. So God, would you heal who needs to be healed, save who needs to be saved today? We thank you for meeting us here. 
We love you, and it's in Jesus' name. Everybody set? Come on, everybody set? Hey, say hi, hi, hi to somebody next to you. You guys can take a seat. It's not, it's not over, it's not over. Well, uh, I don't know how your week went, but on Tuesday night, I took my, uh, my oldest two sons to their very first Nashville Predators game. And my oldest son is five years old and the other one is three years old. And so me and Josh, one of our staff members here, we took them to our Preds game and a guy from the church actually gave us tickets, beautiful seats. We're sitting club level, front row, center ice, right behind the bench. We can literally see everything. And we finally get seated after spending about $85 on some pizza and fries. Come on, somebody. And we sit down and, uh, I mean, I'm talking two minutes into this game. The Vegas Golden Knights, they, uh, they score. And uh, it's one to nothing about three minutes into the game. And then a couple minutes later, they score again. And a couple minutes after that, they score again. Here we are halfway through the first period and the Predators are down three to nothing. And me and Josh just looked at each other like, yo, this game is over before it ever started. But my boys are having such a great time. Don't even know what's going on. We end the first period down 0-3. And this is my son's response right here. Just. <laughs> Just getting it. I wonder if that's what the angels were doing in the tomb when everybody showed up looking for Jesus. They were like, he's not here. You know what I'm saying? And so we're down and uh, second period starts. And right at the beginning again, they score another goal. I mean, it is four to nothing. Finally, we score one, going into the third period, down one to four, and, um, and you could just see the audience, right? Like, people start leaving. The stadium was full now. It's just starting to get empty, and, and I, I kind of was like, well, I mean, the game is over, and so I look at Tatum. Jessica's texting me and like, uh, where are you at? You know, it's nine o'clock. Boys got school tomorrow. What are you doing? How many of you know? Happy wife, happy life. So I'm just, I'm, I'm conversing with my son. I'm like, hey, buddy, um, it's four to one and everybody's starting to leave, amen, buddy. And, uh, and, and, and buddy, you got school in the morning, you gotta get up early. Do you wanna stay or do you wanna go ahead and go home? And he looked back up at me, he said, well, dad, is it over? I'm like, in my head, I'm thinking, yup. <laughs> no, man, it's not over. Right after he asked me that question, the Preds score, two to four. A couple minutes later, they score again, three to four. Now we're down to the third period with like two minutes left on the clock. Preds got a score, game is over. And guess what happens? The Preds score again. Check this out. Look at that hard clap right there. Just, just excited. And so now it's 4-4 and he looks at me and he said, dad, is it over now? I said, no, son, it's not over. It's something called over time. And we go into overtime and they get the puck and don't do nothing with it. We get it, it's three on three. They get the puck to Yossi, Yossi scores. Preds win 5-4. I lift my boy up in the air like he's Simba and we just won the, we won the Super Bowl. I mean, we're just excited. And I got to thinking, like as we left, I was like, yo, I hate it for everybody who missed that moment. <laughs> I hate it for everybody like me who looked at the score like, bro, we 4-1, we going home. All hope is lost. They're not gonna win. It's time to go home and beat the traffic. And it just made me wonder, I wonder how many times you've walked away and missed the miracle God wants to do. <laughs> I wonder how many times you look at your situation and think, man, it's over. There's no hope. The marriage is done. I'll never be what I was called to be. I'll never have a life of purpose. It's just, it's, it's, it's over. It's not over. Can I remind you what my five-year-old believed? He believed when every other adult forgot that it's not over till God says it's over. I came to encourage somebody today to not throw in the towel too quick, to not give up hope so fast to not walk away too soon. I just wonder how many, how many of us have missed the miracle because we walked away in the moment, because we didn't really understand what God was doing and how he could possibly restore what's happened. And it brings us to our text in verse 13. The story opens up and says, now that same day, somebody say same day. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. It says that same day. What day is that? That's that first Easter Sunday. That, that same day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. That, that same day that the enemy thought 
He had won. That, that same day that Jesus told them, I will defeat death, I will rise from the grave, the stone will be rolled away, that it's not over because I'm alive. That same day, that same day, they walk away? I mean, the text said that they knew it was the third day. Jesus told them, hey, I'm gonna die and I'm gonna rise on the third day. Why would you walk away on the third day? There's still time left. Why would you walk away on the third day? Let me tell you why I think they walked away. For the same reason we walk away. Unmet expectation. They thought God would do it the way they thought God would do it. And when God didn't meet their expectation, they were disappointed. They were, they were discouraged. I mean, that's why verse 21 reads, we had hoped, past tense. This lets us know exactly how they're feeling. It says that their face was downcast. Same word that's used for the word depression. They're depressed, they're hurting because it don't feel right leaving without Jesus. I mean, they followed this man for three years, watched him do miracles. But now he's dead and it says that they had hoped he was gonna be the king of Israel. But now here they are and they're discouraged. They had hoped, but now they're headed home. They had hoped he was gonna become king of Israel, but now that, that, that dream is dead. They had hoped he was gonna heal. They had hoped he was gonna break chains. They had hoped that, that God was gonna answer their prayer. But then they saw their hope hung on a cross. And so they're discouraged and they're walking home with their head held down. And it's interesting to me because Jesus walks up next to them and they don't recognize him. And here they are talking to Jesus about how Jesus didn't do what they thought Jesus should do. They were disappointed because he didn't do what they wanted him to do. See, they wanted a lion, but they got a lamb. They wanted a politician, but instead they got a prophet. They wanted a crown on his head, but instead they got a cross on his back. They wanted a throne, but instead they got a grave. They, they, they wanted all of this stuff, but God didn't meet their expectation. They wanted justice, but instead they got grace. They had hoped, and it made me wonder, what have you had hope for? I think we all have had moments in our life where we hoped for something, maybe even from God, and he didn't meet your expectation. And you're discouraged. And what happens is when you get discouraged long enough, you start living defeated. And you view life through the lens of defeat. And you walk away too soon and you throw in the towel because it looks like hope is lost. And I have a feeling you can probably relate. Now, I don't, I don't know what it is for you, but maybe you had hoped for that person in your life who was sick to make it. But this year you lost somebody close to you. Your mother, your father, a sibling, a friend died. And you had prayed and prayed and prayed. You had hoped they were gonna make it, but they didn't make it. You had hoped that that relationship you were in, um, you had hoped that it would end in marriage, but it didn't. You had hoped to grow old with that person you're with, but it didn't work out and now you're divorced. You had hoped that that job, you know, the one you went to college for and got in a lot of debt for, you had hoped that that was actually gonna work out, but you thought it was gonna give you purpose, but the truth is, is you're at a nine to five right now and you have no idea why you're even living. You had hoped to start a family because everybody around you seems to be getting pregnant. And for whatever reason, you, you can't do it. I know I can't be the only one who feels like they've been let down or discouraged or disappointed by God because I personally, I know the pain of loss. I remember when I was in elementary school losing my nanny who, um, who helped raise me for a season. I remember going into middle school and finding out my brother got cancer. You're younger than me, only to find out after we prayed and prayed and prayed, two years later, he died. 
I know, the, I know the pain of losing someone close. I can feel what those disciples were feeling. I can feel how some of you feel right now. I know, I know the loss of a dead dream because since I was five years old, I had hoped to go play division one basketball. And as I was getting recruited, region tournament comes my senior year and I tear my knee and there went every scholarship. I, I remember going off to college, kind of running away. And I had hoped to come home and talk to my family about my faith and how I surrendered my life to Jesus my freshman year of college at the University of Memphis. But when I got home, I found out that my parents were getting a divorce. And I remember watching the discouragement on their face. And then I remember watching my mom, who I was extremely close with, make some bad decisions and end up in a very abusive relationship that tore her apart. And I watched hope leave her eyes. So much so that there was multiple times she tried to take her own life. And I watched as my brother and sister struggled and I felt hopeless because there was nothing I could do to actually fix it. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but some of you walked in and you had hoped in those things. And I just wanna tell you today, and I wanna remind you that though some of that may be true, we still serve a God of resurrection. We still serve a God who can take the dead and bring them back to life. We still serve a God who can break chains. We still serve a God that when you walk away from him, he will walk after you. We still serve a God that when you're hopeless, he can bring hope. I came to preach the shame off somebody today who feels hopeless, who feels unseen, who feels unloved. I need somebody to know God does see you. God loves you. He's faithful. He binds up the wounds of the hurting. He restores those who are crushed in spirit. And if God is in it, it's not over till he says it's over. I don't know who I'm talking to. And you might be like, cool, bro, good for you. But how do you know it's not over? You may tell you how I know, because I know what he did in my life at my darkest moment. And I know what he did in my friends' lives in their darkest moments, when they were hopeless, when they were walking away, just like these men. I know what he did in my mom's life. I know what he's doing in my mom's life. I watched hope leave her eyes but then I got to watch it get restored again as she started coming to church and driving an hour every Sunday to be here. And on December 24th, I got to baptize my mom right here on this stage because it's not over. I wanna remind somebody that if you still got a pulse, God still has a plan. And if you still got a pulse, God still has a, has a purpose. Listen, Easter is a reminder. Resurrection is a reminder. That is always too soon to quit. It's always too soon to walk away. It's always too soon to think that it's over because we serve a God who rose from the dead and rolled the stone away and defeated death and has the keys to life because he stole them from hell. And he came to remind somebody today, it's not over till he says it's over. And so what happens in our life is that pain has a way of causing you to forget the promises of God. Because it's when you focus on, on pain, it seems like nothing else matters and it's all you'll live in and it's all you'll deal with. And so it brings you to a place where it's easier just to walk away than to stay and have faith. And so if that's you today, and you're disappointed by God because God didn't do what you wanted him to do. Can I just gently remind you that God is not obligated to do what you want him to do, but he promises he will do what he needs to do. That God will not necessarily give you everything you want, but he will always be faithful to give you exactly what you need. But here's what you have to understand. What you want may not be the thing that you need. I don't know about you, but if God answered every single one of your prayer requests, you'd be married to about 12 people right now. Come on, is anybody else thankful for unanswered prayers from God? Amen, somebody. I'm just trying to help you see. Maybe, maybe God hasn't met all of your expectations because he wanted to exceed them. And so if you're having a hard time because of the pain in your life and you're here today and you feel hopeless, if you're, ta if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Everybody knows if you take notes, you get to heaven. So you should, I'm kidding, you should, you should take notes and write this down. But if you have a trouble 
remembering the promise of God, number one, you gotta remember his promises. Come on, tell somebody, say remember. Come on, say remember. That's what the angels told the women when they showed up at the tomb. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's risen. Don't you remember? Remember how he told you? Remember he said he was gonna rise on the third day? Why are you discouraged? Why is your heart downcast? He said that he was going to resurrect from the dead. Some of you, you need to remember the promises of God because God says, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. God says that I will be faithful to finish the work that I started. Not the work you started, but the work that he started. We serve a God who says, I work all things together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He says, listen, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. There's a promise from God that implies if it ain't good, God ain't done yet. And some of you need to remember what God has actually spoken. And so here they were, they're headed home with no hope. And all of the sudden, hope shows up. And I think some of you today showed up to church and at one time in your life you had hope, but you walked in hopeless and you had hoped that that spouse of yours would become a believer. And you had hoped that the marriage would work and you had hoped that the addiction would be overcome. And you had hoped that that child of yours that you raised in church that walked away would come home. You had hoped and, and you showed up at church today, not with hope, but hopeless. And in the same way as they were walking away with their head down and hopeless, if that's you today and you left home hopeless, I got good news. Hope followed you here. Hope is alive. Jesus is alive. And your story is not over. That's why he goes, how, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And so now Jesus is actually gonna decide, I wanna reveal myself to them. So the first thing, it starts with us. We gotta remember his word. We gotta remember his promises. When you feel like God is far away, no friends, he's close. He's already spoken to you. But they didn't just need to remember what he said. They needed him to reveal who he was. And so the way in which Jesus decides, you know what? I'm gonna reveal who I am. It says this in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Walk seven miles walks up on them, what y'all talking about? This guy named Jesus, what about him? Well, he was a prophet. It's so funny to me, they're telling Jesus who Jesus is. So he goes, okay, I'm gonna reveal myself to him. I want you to watch what he does. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Why begin with Moses? Well, because Moses is the author of what Jewish, Jewish people would call the Torah, which is the first five books of our Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And I, I don't know exactly what Jesus said. The scriptures just say that he went through and walks them through Moses and all the prophets, which is essentially the entire Old Testament and shared every scripture that concerned him. And so I just imagine he went to Genesis one from the very beginning and was like, you know, in the very beginning, God created man in his image and God placed them in a garden and gave them everything that they needed. And they believed this lie though, because a serpent came in. Y'all remember this story and, and how the serpent came in and convinced them that God was holding out on them. And there was something more they needed in life outside of God, that if they got it, they'd be satisfied. So you remember what they did? They ate, they ate the mango. It wasn't an apple, by the way. Nobody would ever trade their soul for, a, for an apple. It had to be a mango. So do you remember the mango that they had? And, uh, and they're like, yeah, we remember. And he's like, do you remember what happened? Yeah, they were shamed and they went and they hid. Yeah, they were separated from God, you remember? And God said, because you sinned against me, that's gonna bring death and separation. And one day I'm gonna restore. And he, he gave him his promises, but he said, you know, there'll be a time where the woman's offspring, there'll be an enmity between the woman's offspring and the serpent and the serpent will bite his heel, but the offspring will crush his head. I just wonder if Jesus is thinking, I crushed his head. I wonder if he goes to Genesis chapter 22 and he talks about Father Abraham who had many sons and many sons had? Wow, y'all was off key on that. We're just gonna stop now <laughs> while we ahead. That Abraham and Sarah, he had to believe the promise of God and uh, 
They had to wait 100 years to see that promise come to pass. And we can't wait 100 minutes. But they finally have their first son, Isaac, and God does something interesting. He says, Abraham, do you love me? By the way, that's the first time love's ever used in the Bible. Abraham's like, yep. He said, great, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your one and only son. I want you to take him on Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him for the atonement, Abraham, of your sins. And just as the moment as Abraham's about to slay his one and only son, there's a ram that gets caught in the thicket. And God says, Abraham, you believed me. Why don't you take that ram and lay him on the altar? And that ram will pay for your sin. I wonder if Jesus was like, I am the ram. I am the one who went up to on, on Calvary and laid his life down so that the Father did not crush you, but instead crushed me so that all of humanity could be atoned for and forgiven for their sin. Whew, I just imagine him going to Exodus and talking about, and talking about Moses, talking about the Passover. It's like, you remember how you used to have to sacrifice lambs and put their blood over the doorpost of your home? That was kind of weird, right? Yeah, remember how you had to do that? Well, now you don't because I am the Passover. Or do you remember that time when Moses split the, the Red Sea and the, the enemy was coming after him and to get free from being bonded to the Egyptians, Moses had to stretch out a staff. And when he stretched out the staff, the waters parted and he led the people from death to life. He led the people from bondage into freedom. I wonder if Jesus is thinking, on Friday, my body was stretched out on a cross. I made it possible where there was no way for you to walk from death to life, for you to walk from bondage into freedom. Come on, how many of you know that to be true? I just imagine he continues on and he gets, he gets to Leviticus or he skips it because that's what we do on the Bible reading plan. Amen, somebody. Like, oh no, that's too many laws for me to follow. And Jesus is like, yeah, exactly. That's why I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. I wonder if he skips forward and goes into the Psalms and starts quoting off Psalms from David about crucifixion that wasn't even invented till hundreds of years later. I wonder if he goes to Isaiah and he says, do you remember that prophecy about that there would be a, a virgin that has a baby in the town of Bethlehem? And then he went to Zechariah and said, and that one day he would ride in on a donkey. Do, don't you remember? Why are you so slow to believe this? Number two, if you're writing down notes, write this down, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Touch somebody, say, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Can I tell you what I think he was doing here and I wanna do for just a second? I think that Jesus was actually appealing to their logic because they followed him already. And there's some of you in the room and the reason you have a hard time really believing in Jesus is because there's still some questions you have and some understanding you're lacking and you think that that's what's required to follow after him. And I'm not here to shame you and I don't think Jesus was either. I think he goes, okay, you wanna be logical? Let's get logical. So I just wanna tell you for a second, not emotionally, because I know I can get to shouting. I know I can get to stomping and screaming and crying and all that stuff. And some of you, that don't move you. And I'm not here to emotionally manipulate you. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell you logically why I believe that he was not just a teacher. He was not just a good man. He was not just another prophet. He was not just another priest and he was not just another king. He was God in the flesh. Let me tell you why. Number one, because of the impact he had on history. There has never been another human being in the history of the world that has had an impact like Jesus Christ. Nobody. I don't care where you're from. I don't care how you grew up. I don't care what you believe. You can be agnostic, you can be atheist, you can be Buddhist, you can be Hindu, you can be Muslim. It doesn't matter what language you speak, what part of the world you live in. No one can deny the fact that Jesus Christ has had the greatest impact on history than anyone else. And if you wanna argue me on it, that's fine. Tell me what year it is, please. Oh, y'all ain't follow me? What year is it? 2024. Well, I don't know if you know, but the earth has been around a lot longer than 2024 years. Do you know why it's the year 2024 and every religion, every country, every nation, every tribe will acknowledge that it's 2024 because 2024 years ago, there was a little baby born in Bethlehem by a virgin named Mary that ended up being a Jewish carpenter and his name was Jesus. You can love him, you can hate him, but you cannot deny him because you can't tell time without him. <laughs> How about that devil? But that's not the only reason why. I logically believe that he is the son of God because of the prophecies he fulfilled. 
Do you know in Jesus' time on earth, three and a half years, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies? Did you know the odds of anyone ever doing that in their lifetime? Here are the odds. If someone were to fulfill only eight prophecies in their lifetime, here's the odds that that could happen. One out of 100 quadrillion. For somebody to fulfill 48 prophecies, it would be one out of 10 to the 150th power. We ain't even got a number that high. But for somebody to fulfill over 300 prophecies in three years on earth, only God himself. But that's not it. I want you to watch what happens next in the story because it says this in verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. So here they are walking. Jesus is like, all right, I guess the conversation's over. They're like, hold up. He's like, what? What can I do for you? It says, they urged him strongly. Said, stay with us. The day's almost over. It's nearly light time. It's getting dark. They said, why don't you come in and stay with us? And so it says, he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. He ghosted them. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? I want you to realize something. For those who are logical, I want you to notice that Jesus appealed to their logic for seven miles. And here I am appealing to your logic for seven minutes. And after Jesus himself shares all the scriptures that concerned himself, they still didn't know it was him. They did not know that it was the son of God until they invited him in. Touch a neighbor, say, invite him in, invite him in. And here's what happens when you invite him into your home. Here's what happens when you invite him in is Jesus moves from just being up here and he starts to come alive in here. It says that their hearts were burning inside of them. That there was something happening below the surface. There was something at that moment that was happening Deep down in their heart, it's almost as if what Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel 36, that he will take your heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. It's almost as if their heart was hardened, not because they didn't know Jesus existed, but they just didn't understand who he really was. And it's as if in that moment that their heart of stone started to melt and become a heart of flesh, started beating. And it was in that moment that they realized he is not just another prophet. He did not come just to save Israel. He's the savior of the world and it's not over because this is God in the flesh. Can I get an amen in the house? And you know what I pray for? I pray your heart's burning right now. Because I think there's some of you that as I've been teaching and as we've been opening up the scriptures, You feel that same heartburn. And you feel this like weight on your chest. And and, and you're fighting back your tears right now. And you're not trying to get emotional because you don't want to look weak. But there's something inside of you that knows the feeling of hopelessness and knows the feeling of walking away too soon and knows the feeling of giving up and and maybe just maybe it's not a feeling that you're feeling. Maybe it's something in your heart that God is trying to transform. Maybe it's the Holy Spirit tapping you on the shoulder and saying, I know you came here hopeless, but I showed up and my name is Hope. I showed up and my name is Jesus and it ain't over till I said it's over. So I don't just believe in it because of history. I don't just believe in it because of prophecy. Let me tell you why I ultimately believe that Jesus is the son of God and is the only way to everlasting life. It's because he raised from the dead and we have proof that he raised from the dead. Because after it says their heart was burning, I want you to watch what it says in verse 33. It says they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. 
<laughs> You're like, well, that don't seem like much proof, Pastor. Who cares? Why does that matter? So what? They went up and they got back and then went to Jerusalem. Cool. You me tell you why that matters? Because it matters because Jerusalem meant danger. Jerusalem was not safe. You remember at the beginning, they were leaving Jerusalem and going out of Jerusalem to Emmaus. Let me tell you why. Because the body was gone and the authorities thought it had been stolen. This is why the disciples were hiding in the upper room because they were afraid that if they found them and they knew they were disciples of Jesus, they too would be killed. And so they leave Jerusalem fleeing. So the question then is this, why would they go back? Why would they go back to Jerusalem? Why would they be willing to risk their life? Let me tell you why. They went back because Jesus got up. They they went back because they saw him crucified on a Friday and Saturday was silent. But on Sunday, they were standing before and sitting with at a table, the risen God who rolled the stone away and defeated death and stole the keys to hell and said, I am alive, hope is here, it's not over. That's why they went back. You wanna tell you why they went back? Because there was still 11 more people hiding in an upper room fearing for their life. They had to go back to Jerusalem because there were some people that they cared about that were still hopeless. There were some people still discouraged. There were some people still doubting. There were some people who felt let down. There were some people who were disappointed. Just like some of you in the room today, this is the reason why you maybe got invited by somebody because we didn't just show up at 5 a.m. to set it up and people didn't just come to hear some preacher. People didn't just come to sing karaoke with a band. People didn't just come to do some egg drop. No, people got here and set all of this up for you and invited you in this house because they know that God is alive, that hope is alive, that Jesus is here and your story is not over. They went back. Can I tell you something? Jesus came back for you. He he walked with them as they walked away from him. He pursued them. Can I tell you right now, God is pursuing some of you. And so here's my question. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? Here's my next question. Have you invited him in? Because it's one thing to believe it up here. You know the enemy believes it up here. You, You do know that Satan knows that Jesus robbed the grave. That's why he's still trying to convince some of you that he has authority over your life. But I got good news for you. The enemy doesn't hold the keys to your life. Jesus does. I'm not asking, have you invited him in your logic? I'm asking, have you invited him into your heart? And so here's what I wanna do. I I want everyone, and I know some of you, you're like, oh, I'm here every week. Good for you, I'm glad you're here too. I need you to get out that connect card that you were handed when you came in. Everybody get it out real quick. We do this every Easter. And on the back of it, it it, it asks you to give a response. And um, I came up with like six different responses that I thought might meet you where you are, but but maybe give you the next step in your journey because we all have a next step. So whether you're a member here, whether you come here weekly, I I know you probably filled these out before and you're like, you got my information. Well, you can attest, we didn't sign you up for Christian Mingle or Farmers Only or anything like that. So here's what I wanna ask you to do, okay? I just, for your sake, would you just write your first and last name, like legible on the top of that thing and your email and your cell phone number? And the reason why is because in the same way Jesus walked with them, we wanna walk with you. And just as I'm talking right now, you can fill this out. There's six different responses. And for some of you, um, the response is, I already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we just wanna know that. We wanna know how to help disciple you. So would you just mark that box saying, I already have a relationship with Christ. For others of you, your faith with Christ is private and it's time for you to go public in your faith, which is why next weekend, your next step is to get baptized. And so we're having a baptism Sunday to experience and identify publicly that your faith is in Jesus. For, for others of you, um, maybe, maybe you just need a little bit more time. I gotta I got have some time to consider this. I don't wanna make an emotional decision. Don't. I don't need you to make an emotional decision. That's why I'm not being emotional. I'm not trying to manipulate you into doing something that you don't know what you're doing. 
There's some of you in the room that never intend on following Jesus. And people think that's a joke. Why would you put that on there? You may tell you why, because I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you're going through or what you believe, this will be a house where every single person is welcome because everybody is welcome at the table of God and you can have a seat in this place. So if you never intend on following Jesus and you're just looking for community, welcome home. But just say, I never intend on it. There's others of you that you followed Jesus for a little while and then you walked away and God's calling you back home and you need to rededicate your life. And then there's a group of you who've never put your faith in Jesus. You've never made the decision to follow Jesus and trust him for the forgiveness of your sins. Let me tell you what happens when you do that. Romans tells us that when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You've heard that word, saved. What does that mean? Safe from what? Safe from your sin. Safe from the penalty of sin, which is eternal separation in hell. Safe from the power of sin that you don't have to live under sin's influence in your life. You'll still struggle, but you will always have the Holy Spirit within you to overcome it and ultimately be safe from yourself. Because some of you, you've been trying to save yourself for too long and coming to church, that ain't gonna save you. Being a good person, that ain't gonna save you. Reading your Bible every day, it's great. Reading itself isn't gonna save you. The God of the Bible though will. And so some of you today, when I say put your faith in Jesus, it's this, it's that I trust that his payment on the cross was sufficient for me. And not only did he die for me, he died instead of me. And instead of God one day placing all of his wrath and all of his judgment on my life because of my sin, I believe he already poured out his wrath on his son. And because his son did not stay in the grave, but raised from the dead, you and I can be forgiven. And scripture says it is by grace, through faith, not of yourselves, not by your religious works, but by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And today you just go, I accept you. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to pray a prayer for those of you making that decision right now. And if you would, would you bow your head and close your eyes? And if you're watching online and overflow, bow your head, close your eyes. If you're driving, keep them open. Amen, somebody. Um, and I just want you to pray this with me. And church, for those of you who say I already have a relationship with God, would you pray this out loud so they also know they're not alone? Pray this with me. Say, today, I give you my life. I believe you died for me and you rose from the grave so that I can be forgiven for my sin. I surrender my life. This is my new beginning. And on the count of three, nobody looking around, every head bowed, eyes still closed. On the count of three, I just, if that's you and you prayed that today for the first time or you rededicated your life, there's no shame, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. On the count of three, I just want you to shoot your hand up high and let me know that you made that decision today. One, God loves you. Two, you don't have to be the same. Three, just shoot your hand up right now and say, I made that decision. Hands going up everywhere. Here, 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 here. Come on, lift your hand up if that's you today. I see you in the back. I see you two people in the back over here. I see you, ma'am, over here. I see you on the back wall. I see you in the back row over here. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the hands lifted. I thank you for the hearts that are transformed today. I thank you that it may look over, but with you, it's not over. God, I thank you for being the God of resurrection. We worship you today and we all stand and we say amen. Come on, church, why don't we celebrate those and welcome them into the family of God? Come on, stand to your feet. Let's worship. Let's celebrate with the angels in heaven.